Excellent. Uh, you, you mentioned something which, again, caught my attention. Uh, and since we would be transitioning into investing, you said it's important to to, to keep your uh, keep yourself differentiated as a as an investor and and build a brand uh, could you shed some more light like how does this in this why why is this so important as an investor um and how is this adding value to keep yourself differentiated well the idea as an investor is one you want access to sort of the, the highest quality deals second is that the highest quality deals need to choose you and the highest quality deals might not always be the most popular with investors. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Uh, but you need to either find them or they need to find you. Uh, and two, they need to choose you to be on, on the cap table, right? So because of that, that, that's something that doesn't happen in public markets. In public markets, you just go and put money into company X. They don't really know or care who you are. Mm. Um, whereas in early stage, that's not how it works. And especially in at seed and pre-seed, where there aren't really a ton of established traction metrics that sort of everyone is uh, is chasing. So once you get to Series A, Series B, there's only certain small set of companies that are out there, whereas the funnel is massive at uh, at pre-seed and seed. So there needs to be an avenue for these companies to come find you uh, or uh, uh, some sort of mechanism for you to go find them. Traditionally, the way it's worked in venture is you have this massive network of both other investors and founders, and they essentially identify and source deals for you. Now, that's great if especially if you were early into venture you know if you've been here since the early 2000s or sort of the, the, the mid 2000s you've probably uh if you were a good investor you've built up a pretty good brand and so founders know who you are and they've uh secured uh if you're trying to get into investing today uh, the the pool of investors is significantly larger mm -hmm. the even with sort of the, the new macro reality and capital being a bit more scarce, there still is a very large pool of investors. So if a new founder who's just sort of had an idea and, and, the next, and he's created his company in the last six months, if he wants to go out and source uh, new investors, how's he going to do it? He's going to make a list of, uh, of essentially brand name investors. He's going to ask people he knows. So essentially, he's going to come down to brand or, uh, or network. And if you're trying to build a brand for yourself, it needs to be unique in some way, shape, or form. What makes you different? And it's very, very hard to be different today if you're a new investor who is a generalist. Um, so it's always best to at least, at the start, carve out a niche for yourself. Um, mm. Personally, I, I'm a big believer that at pre-seed and seed in particular, specialist investors help because they're not just there and making introductions. They're actually helping you with uh, key uh decision points with, with product and with growth uh, it's not that generalist investors can't do that uh it's just specialist investors can really help so 0.9 capital in europe is, is a great example right mm -hmm. uh they've managed to build a great brand with uh with SaaS, and they're genuinely uh, are helpful um and they have that brand so if you're a SaaS investor the first name you would have on your list is is 0.9 capital Speed Invest has made a good name for themselves by having sort of specialized teams within. They've got a deep tech team, they've got a marketplaces and a consumer team. Uh, so one of the first names you would have as a, 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 one of the first fund names you would have as a marketplace founder would be Speed Invest. There's not a, there's not a ton of specialist uh, investors. There. And so that goes for whether you're an angel or whether you're a fund, having a very defined brand that so, something that founders can associate you with this is why you're the right investor for me uh is exceptionally important got it so uh i was listening to this conversation with with dipali uh which i think timo was having or you on one of them so we have a uh, upskillers as a podcast uh, we, which we, we plan to revive it as well uh so dipali was saying capital is a commodity everybody can give uh, capital what founders are looking for not just money they want the right investors at the at the right time. And I think this is what you are hinting at, because if you are known as somebody who has a certain expertise that can add value massively to that to that team, then 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 the deals would automatically come to you. It becomes easier, isn't it? Yeah. And um, also, when the deals come to you, you're not sort of fighting for allocations. Like your allocation is secure. Other investors are fighting fighting it out among themselves. Oh, that's that's. That's also valuable, isn't it? Oh, okay. So, 
So your deal is secured because they want you badly. It's not like on the other. Yeah, because uh, uh, yeah, so they because money. you bring very specific value, where other uh, some other investors might not. They might might have a certain sort of generalized brand, but they're not really sure what value add they bring. And so, if they were going to have a commitment fight it out, it would probably be there. Got it. Um, I, I was looking. I was watching. Uh, Shark Tank of India, you know the the Indian variant, right? I've come across it, and, and that's where when there is a really good startup, uh, and then there there, there is this panelists, they would fight because then they would start branding themselves that you know what I am gonna make the right connections for you, or I am gonna help you create that brand, and I I think this is what uh, now I can make the connections because each investor also needs to sell himself on what he can bring yeah. to the table, especially when. Um, when the cap table, when you're competing for that equity, yeah, isn't correct. it? Yeah, because even in this market, you do see oversubscribed deals. And when that happens, it's uh, it's not the investors with the clearest value add are tend to be the most secure on the cap table. Ah, nice. Excellent. This is this is uh, aha moment for me. Let's talk about bread, breadcrumb.vc. What, what is it about? It's really a, a label for now that ties together everything I do. So I do three things mainly, right? So one is the, the Atomic Angel program, and I'm, and I'm investing in pre-seed and seed startups with network effects. Um, that takes up roughly half my time. The other half of my time is split between running the course on Maven uh, called Applied Network Effects. And the last bit is a little bit of consulting for early and growth stage companies, occasionally for investors. That's also about network effects. So breadcrumb.vc is really what ties everything together. That's one label. In practical terms, what it is, if you go to breadcrumb.vc, it's the set of essays that I wrote in the first year of the pandemic when I had an awful lot of time on my hands. And I basically wrote a book's equivalent of uh, essays about network effects. And my course is basically built off of all that content content I created in the first year of the pandemic. How can one get to your course, by the way? So you could, you could go to course.breadcrumb.vc or that will give you a direct link to Maven, or just go to Maven and search for applied network effects. In fact, if you Google for it, also it'll, it'll come. Out, it'll come. Out, it'll be one of the first results. Course breadcrumbs, right? Uh, Course dot breadcrumb dot VC singular. And then VC. I'm 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 just doing a, a Google search, and it gives me a list of homemade breadcrumbs. <laughs> so <I'm, laughs> Which is why singular, singular. <laughs> Uh, okay. If you oh, search for applied network effects, <laughs> that should that should take care of it. Okay, let me let me do that live. Okay, so this is this is what I try to do, <laughs> and uh, co- oh, yeah, that course. Ah, this is this is this is. <laughs> I did, I did. Yeah. Okay. Course. Oh, okay. Great. There you go. So we are so here. This is, this is the very rough landing page I have. If you click on learn more, that will take you to the prettier landing page that Maven has. Ah, uh, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I, I know of, um, uh, of course, Maven became hugely popular. Uh, my, my sister runs a TikTok course on Maven. So that's how I know uh, a little more. Uh, and then, um, and you, how, how long is the course, by the way? It's three weeks. It's two sessions per week. And the time commitment is roughly six to eight hours a week. Each nice. session goes on for about two and a half hours. And, and the way I run it is the first session is uh, one set of concepts about one type of network effect. And the second uh, session of that week is, all right, you know those concepts. Here are three companies. Tell me what you think, uh, which tends to be a lot of fun for me. <laughs> Got it. And and the target audience, as, as you mentioned here, is it's, founders, yeah, investors. And... Yeah, so it's three sets. Founders, investors, or if you work on product or growth at a tech company, uh, that prob- or at a company that is network effects aligned, uh, okay. you'd probably find value in it. Got it. And, and and you talk about uh, properties, monetization, liquidity is something that you mentioned already, virality and stuff like that. This is this is massively valuable. Um, excellent. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that as well. Um, you, you mentioned about so the, your, your three uh, engagements. Tell us a bit about Atomico. I've been hearing a lot about Atomico. Maybe maybe what, what is Atomico? Uh, Atomico is a uh... A Series A and beyond uh, venture capital firm. It was founded by the uh, the founders of Skype, uh, Nicholas Zenstrom being uh, sort of the, the key uh, key person there. And so they've they've been uh, pretty early in the European venture game back in back when nobody actually took European venture seriously. Um, and their aim of the aim for the Atomico uh, Angel program basically is part partly it's to create new 
a, a new generation of investors essentially um mm-hmm. so a lot of people on the At- atomic angel program were f- you know, folks in the tech ecosystem who hadn't really invested before or didn't really invest seriously before and essentially give them a uh, a platform to um il- invest you know either professionally or semi professionally mm-hmm. um so the way the program works is almost like uh, uh like a little fund so you get uh, an allocation to yourself and you get a 25% carry on the investments you make on uh, uh from that uh from that pool uh so not very different from uh atomic or being an lp and it's a pretty hands off relationship once you you have access to the capital we write up an investment memo and submit it and the cash gets wired to the startup and uh atomico doesn't really kind of say invest in this don't invest in that there's very sort of broad ground rules it's invest in european startups don't invest in gambling drugs and porn that's about it uh, and what how much is the capital usually they they offer to uh i'd for for uh, someone entering the angel program for the first year it's uh, 100k usd and uh, we they also have this alumni program so angels that have made you know uh, that have been active under the program so i'm currently a part of the alumni program where you get a little bit more capital uh, to go and deploy over i, I think a two year period got it help me understand how this end up. this is also called a scout program isn't it yes but the 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 term scout program tends to have two connotations so sometimes it's it's this which is a, a scout fund sometimes it's a scout program where you as a scout go and source deals and send those deals to the vc fund and if the vc fund invests then you get some sort of benefit from it either carry or a sort of a cash bonus so a scout program is a bit of a, a bit more of a hazy term is it includes both the angel program definitely means this got it so so why do big vcs have such uh, scout programs is it because they so there are vcs who do a minimum of 20 million or 30 million stuff like that uh is it to 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 not lose out on opportunities that could be bigger so that's why they delegate this to to scouts or what what is the bigger motive behind um, uh, vcs running angel programs well more than anything else it's probably visibility right uh now atomico for example mostly does series a and beyond investing right so that i think they've only gotten involved in uh rounds like 5 6 7 million and plus uh, uh i think that's probably gbp um but essentially they if every vc firm needs a pipeline of companies that they want to look at in the next year and the next year and the next year and pre seed and seed tends to be the one the zones where the, the top of the funnel is largest because founders can come from anywhere it's not just second time founders uh, or well known founders who are creating great companies it's completely unknown first time founders as well mark zuckerberg and evan spiegel as two sort of wild ass examples are folks that build massive companies and came and came from practically nowhere right mm-hmm. um and so you always want to keep an eye on what's happening at earlier stages and so the angel program angel programs or scout programs or angel programs in particular are a good way of keeping an eye on what's happening in the early stage ecosystem there's there's no sort of signaling risk or commitment there because th- this is not a relationship with the fund when i make an investment i am managing the the relationship i am essentially the uh, the fund manager you know if there's a uh, whatever advice would need to happen whatever communication need to happen would happen uh, via me and and at any point if atomico uh uh sees that you know company xyz is becoming interesting oh by the way they've got this angel on on the cap table he's our angel that that's an easy way to get access to that company right um and so it uh, it opens doors it, it provides visibility uh, more so than anything else whereas a scout program basically generates deal flow for what the com- com- what the fund is investing in right now so you know if they have a scout who's focused on healthcare investments uh, scout x would source uh, a particular deal bring it to the fund and at the fund invest the scout let's say get 5 gets 5% carry in that deal got it how, how do they look look out for uh, say new investor you said a new investor would get 100k um, capital mm-hmm. uh, what do they look look out for in a potential new uh, investor that they would want to give money I think generally I've seen three or four sort of archetypes of of folks that uh, that fit. Uh one is a community builder, right? So you've created a community with a specific theme, 
uh, Dipali is a perfect example of that, right? So she created Alma Angels. She had, uh, because uh, that community, she had a great brand as someone who backs female founders and also had a very strong deal flow of female founders, thanks to the community, right? So that was one archetype because uh, community builders tend to be very deeply entrenched into the, uh, into the ecosystem. The second one is someone essentially who's a builder. So uh, a founder or someone who works in product at a great company because uh, founders tend to seek out other builders when they're trying to build something sort of in their area or in their zone, especially in their if they're deeply entrenched in the ecosystem. Third, I would say are essentially someone who has domain expertise in a particular area. And so similarly, if you have domain expertise and you're in the ecosystem, odds are that the founder would seek you out when they're building something in your domain. Mm. So uh, those, those are essentially the three broad uh, archetypes you would see. And so the way they find them is, you know, very similar to how everything else happens in venture, which is personal networks, which is, okay, who do they know? Who do they know? Uh, and who do those people know? And so at one point, there's a submission form of uh, where existing angels put in names of people they think might be interesting. Uh, and then the Atomico also looks at other folks uh, who they might know themselves. And then they there's this massive triangulation exercise of, um, you know, uh, are there any biases that they've got? Do how do they have coverages across multiple regions, across multiple work verticals, across multiple specializations? Uh, and so once you have all of that, then you kind of get a, a final list of what it looks like. Got it. And and do they have full autonomy once the money is granted, or do they need to like validate or get it reviewed on where are you yeah. making your investments? No. So uh, the only sort of validation is. You know, certain sort of documentation that needs to be submitted along with the deal and in an investment mem memo. I've never had a, a case of you can't invest in X because we don't like it. Uh, okay. The only thing is you can't do series A deals because the whole point of the, the angel program is pre-seed and seed. Uh, so if you're going sort of too far outside that, then it would be uh, it would be a no. But outside of that, there's, there's no real uh, requirement. It's really what your thesis is as an angel, what you like and what to invest in. But but that wouldn't that be a little riskier, especially somebody who is new, or is that some a risk that they are willing to take? To well, that's the point, right? I mean, there's there's no way to avoid risk in at pre seed and seed investing, and so um, sometimes angel, angels, especially with the first time when they're when they're starting out, if you don't really have a focus area, it can be a bit difficult because then you're trying to dabble and figure out where you you want to go and how you want to support these founders. So uh, some some folks are especially good at sort of getting over that very very quickly and it's finding a, a niche uh, or something like that um and yeah i mean at the end of the day you know the, everything has a power law uh vc funds have a power law startups have a power law and i i, I assume angel angels would also have a power law in the sense that there's an awful lot that are going to try it out some of them are going to stick with it and, and be good good with it others are probably a lot of uh, angels might find uh, other avenues uh, that they uh, that they like better or not. I, no, I would say angel investing is not for everyone. It's uh, it's it's a lot of work. It takes an awful lot of time. And you know, if you're if you're an existing founder, sometimes it can be really really hard uh, to commit that time. Um, so so in my case, I'll give you an example. I've made seven investments so far, including one I'm trying to close right now. I've looked at 472 deals so far. <laughs> It's probably not a huge number for uh, for a VC firm, but for an individual angel, that's a lot of deals. Did you say 47 or 470? 472. So I'm not talking about, I haven't, I haven't had 472 calls, but those are the deals I've evaluated. So I have a, a deal flow sheet where I track you know, all the investments I've passed on, all the investments I've made to make sure that whatever, if something I've passed on turns out to be, a, or turns out to be huge, there's probably some learnings in there for me. Uh, so it's important to, to track it. So at least in terms of, what I've tracked, it's 472 deals. Got it. Um, so many questions um, coming to my mind. Uh, um, you, you you talked about angels supporting founders. Um, so is this is this a requirement? Like there are passive angels as well, isn't it? Like so so, or does a definition of an angel needs to be actively involved with the founding team, helping them out and giving them support? I mean, from Atomico's point of view or from any VC firm's point of view when they're running an angel program, it's really up to the angel. Uh, it really depends on how you want to go do this. Uh, and so if you have a really, really established brand, a really clear brand, and sort of you're, you're comfortable just putting the money and sort of sitting back, that's but that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, if you're someone who's sort of still 
emerging in the ecosystem. Uh, odds are you're going to need to put in a, a lot more work to get there. And so it becomes harder and harder to become a, uh, to stay as a passive a angel while also getting access to great deals and uh, getting on the cap table of great deals. And but you, but if you have a, a wide portfolio, uh, there is again you do not have the bandwidth to be active to all, isn't it? So you have yeah, to be that's active. true. You have to pick and choose your time, and so this is all. And this is where again, Atomico gives you a lot of leeway as to kind of how you want to construct your portfolio. There is a minimum ticket size. Uh, I think you can't go below or ten k USD or something like that. And so mm -hmm. there's a there's a maximum uh, as well. So you kind of figure out how you allocate your uh, your time. In my case, what the so a comfort zone I've fallen into is I can do five to six deals uh, a year. That's high conviction deals. So that gives me enough time to allocate. A, so, uh, that gives me you know, enough space to allocate some of my time to each of these companies, at least the ones that uh, that feel like they want to opt for that. So every time I invest, I tell the founders, look, I have the option of uh, I can give you an hour a month and we can go through what metrics you need to measure. Uh, what needs to change in the product, what, what, how growth is going and stuff like that. And it's up to you whether you want to take it up or not. But on average, that's basically what I end up spending across each company. Uh, if it's a, when it's a pre-seed company, it tends to be a bit more. When it's a seed company, it tends to be a bit less because they have more resources. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there's always exceptions uh, in cases where you know, you've gotten so close to the team where, it, where you, you want to continue supporting them as they, uh, as they grow. Uh, but yeah, I, I think... I, five to six companies a year i should be able to uh to manage because the idea is as you know uh, things progress some companies will scale to series a series b and they will not need as much help uh from you some companies will unfortunately uh go bust which what how is what happens in startup land and so so there's no avenue for you to support them anymore uh until, until you know the founders are off to their to their next thing and so odds are that that time commitment will will even out Got it. You you mentioned about power law. Could you explain what what did you mean by the power law? I mean, broadly, it means that a small percentage of companies uh, uh, are responsible for the for a large percentage of of returns. So in 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 pretty much in any venture funds portfolio, it's always one or two companies that are really massively driving the returns. Um, uh, that that's true for angels as well. Uh, that's true for venture funds as well, in the sense that th that's why they talk about the top quartile VC firm. Uh, those firms are ones that actually have good returns, and the vast majority of the VC industry does not actually have great returns. But that's fine, because as an LP, if you're investing in VC as an asset class, those top performers are going to make up for uh, for the others. And so you will see that in angels, in sort of startup, individual startup investments in venture funds, that tends to, to happen in the early stage ecosystem. Got it. So... So since we have uh, broached the, the topic already, uh, for angels who are <clears throat> making their commitment, especially um, I, was, I was having a, a chat with Yuan, I was asking him, okay, uh, could you could you let me know how many deal flows you expect in the next year or so? Because I need to plan my finances. Because there's no there's no point is in only investing in a couple, couple of couple of deals, right? Because that is too too risky. What is a good portfolio how many portfolios one should have to de-risk yourself some say 20 some say 40 some say 50 uh, because as you said there are always this power law right so there are always this this few few of them in, in your entire portfolio which will make up uh <clears throat> for the for the rest massively so what is do you is there a rule of thumb is there any frameworks there i don't think there's a right answer there it's, it's obviously there, there is a minimum number but um you know, you've got two broadly different approaches here. You've got sort of the Kima Ventures approach, which is to invest in almost every credible deal and essentially have a high volume portfolio, right? They've, mm. got, they've done uh, 100 plus uh, deals, 100 plus portfolio companies. So with that sort of model, you're not really banking on, on value add. You're sort of banking on, you put a, give a little bit of uh, money across this large portfolio. Some of them are going to, uh, are going, are going to take off. Uh, you provide sort of some value add in terms of connecting them to the to the right people when they when they need help. That's kind of that's that's about it, um, and and that's a completely viable uh, viable strategy in the early stage ecosystem, right? The other strategy is concentrated high conviction bets in a handful of startups where you can actively support them uh, over time. Uh, that's the one that I follow. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the right one, 
but it is a it is one of the right ways to uh, to do it. So you've got um, in in the US, benchmark for example is one that follows that model. So they don't make high volume investments; they make a handful of bets uh, each year, and they sort of build and support those companies. And so that's uh, that that's the one that I subscribe to, but it's not the only uh, successful model. So Kima Ventures here in Europe is is sort of a pretty good example of someone that's done those. Uh, uh, sort of a much broader portfolio. I think, you know, um, Calmstorm also does something like 100 plus uh, um, uh, in investments a year or something sort of in that in that vicinity. So both models work. I, I think you can't do something in the middle. That's when you sort of run into trouble uh, where you're sort of sem sem semi-convinced about what this does, but you still want to do like 40, 50 deals a year. That, that, that's where you run into trouble. Um, now, in the grand scheme of things, over like a two to three year period, I think you certainly need to have more than, let's say, 15 companies, right? So if you're doing one or two companies a year, that's, that, I think that might be a bit of a problem where sort of the power law start, might start working uh, against you. But if you're doing, sorry, you know, 15, 20 companies over a three-year period, I think that's that's reasonable. People say it's sorry, 20 companies, but 20 companies doesn't mean much by itself. It also means what time frame. 20 companies a year is still quite a lot, uh, whereas 20 companies over three years is, is, fa is a fairly constrained amount. Got so when you said high concentration, high conviction, where does conviction come from? What what are the factors that are crucial for you to invest in a company with high conviction? So for for every investor is different. So for me specifically, what I'm looking for is one. So when I initially speak to the founder, what's their relationship to the problem, right? Why are they going after this specific problem? Sometimes great companies can come from you know founders just thinking I want to start a company and they ideate and come up with the market. But it's more. It more often happens when uh, uh, the founder has a relationship with the problem. There, there's a saying that says that founders need to be missionaries, not mercenaries. And you're much more likely to be missionary, a missionary, if you have some sort of personal relationship with this problem that you really want to solve this. So even when things go bad, you're going to keep sticking to it. Uh, and, and I can see that in in some of my portfolio companies, even when things are sort of you know when, when shit hit the fan, uh, they're plowing through it. Uh, and sometimes you wonder how they manage to do it because you would probably drive, I would probably drive myself insane in that scenario. But, but um, you know, I, I've thought through this. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I've thought through this. <clears throat> sometimes it becomes, I mean, uh, uh, fake storytelling as well because you want to make it look good yeah. on a pitch deck. And and I also look at the other thing, which is uh, other aspect, which is fair. Like as an entrepreneur, if I look at a problem which is a great opportunity to solve, it might not be. I'm not deeply resonate resonating with it but if i can like if if i see that okay there is there is garbage problem in my in my town and if i resolve this garbage problem i'm going to make ton of money it's high value but it i does i do not resonate I, this is not my life's mission okay uh, so this is other aspect of it but do you do you not give it equal credibility I mean that's fair. So I'm 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 not saying that I would say no to a founder just because uh, they don't have the personal relation to, to it. It's just a very positive signal in my mind. Assuming sort of I it it seems authentic and it's not like a, a, a made up story, which is kind of sometimes it hard, is hard to tell. Some founders are really really good at at weaving a story, right? Um, the reason I say that is because you know building a startup is a seven to ten year journey, mm -hmm. and it's not linear. It's not going to be all. Sort of roses and uh, uh, sugar and roses, or, or whatever other term you might want to use. Odds are, at some point, you're going to come to a life or death situation. Mm -hmm. Odds are, at some point, you're going to run into a fundraising difficulty. Uh, odds are, at some point, you're going to need to lay off employees. So the question is, how do you respond in those scenarios? If you don't really feel closely tied to the to the mission of this particular company you started, will you be able to push through those hard times? And so that it's it's not sort of network effect reasoning. It's just sort of a, it's a very human reasoning. And so that that's really where it, where it comes from. It's not that the market potential isn't great or these these can't be huge businesses. It's just kind of what happens to uh, the human element of the founder when you hit those points and you don't have when you don't really deeply believe in what you're trying to do. That's right. the that's the challenge. So that's right. sort of the one piece of it. Once I sort of got that out of the way, yeah. The first step for me is okay. I need to have a very, very deep understanding of this interaction. So can the founder explain this interaction to me crisply, neatly in sort of a couple of sentences? But understand people... interaction, did you say? Yeah, I mean, every network effect based business is based on an interaction between two users, whether it's the same type of user or different type of users, right? Got it. right? 
Um, and so can you very clearly explain to me what that interaction is? So essentially the user journey of one user coming in and finishing completing the interaction with the other user and why that's better than existing alternatives. Right. Now, when a founder does not have a good enough idea of what the interaction is, and they, and they can't basically explain it to me in a couple of sentences, I mean, imagine how are they going to explain it to a user? Like, what is the user supposed to do? So that's a huge red flag to me. That that's At that point, that's the, the instant no. Right. Um, so especially for a network effect based business, it's, it's exceptionally important. You can't just come in and say, we want to, you know, uh, I don't know, raise the world's consciousness or something, the WeWork approach. It doesn't really work with, with network effect. You need to have a very, very specific, deep understanding of what uh, the interaction is. Got it. So once, I mean, I mean, most of my first calls tend to focus really on those two things. Uh, there's lots of follow-up questions that come out uh, based on what they've told me about the interaction. But essentially what I'm trying to do is then assess based on my understanding of network effect, how scalable is this, how defensible is this, what challenges are they going to face longer term. Um, and at that point, it's okay. Uh, I've understood the interaction. I want to see your, your story. I'm sold on those two. Next, I want to see how well is the interaction working so far. And so for this, you don't need to have you know, thousands of users, even if you have a small set of you know, three or four customers, if you're a B2B company, uh, a few hundred users, or even 50, 60 users, if you're a B2C company, it right. can be enough data to give you a signal. So uh, when I see those early re engagement retention metrics, it tells me whether the early users are finding value in this interaction. And as you, more users come on, is it increasing the value of the product for all users? If that's not happening, it's a no. Even if I'm sold on the interaction, it seems like a great intuitive idea. Implementation-wise, it doesn't seem to be working. So something is broken. Uh, for my, if I were, if they were a portfolio company, I would spend a lot of time with them to figure out what's broken and how to fix it. But since they're not, I don't have to do that. I'll just tell them that this metric. Generally, what I do is when they share the metrics with me, whatever I do with them on a Google Sheet, I'll share it back with them. So they have a clear idea of why I'm saying no. Um, this is exactly why. And so if down the line, if that gets fixed, come back to me and we can have another chat. Uh, so broadly, that's about it. That's how I get the conviction. Uh, the, obviously, there's, there's references as well, which is sort of non-network effects. Everyone would do that. That's for me to get a sense of how the founder uh, likes to work, what their strengths and weaknesses are. How can I actually help them? Uh, if obviously there's a very, very red, big red flag that comes off in the references, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, but otherwise, that's basically how I build conviction. It's not a very complicated process. Um, and in, and I'll, I'll also emphasize, when you're making pre-seed pre and seed investments, especially for a network effect-based business, growth and traction is not a signal. Uh, is not a signal. Is not a signal. A lot uh -huh. of times, um, and I've seen some sort of generalist VCs uh, do this, where they've kind of pushed a company to grow. And so the top line sort of, looking very, very good. And then you look at the retention and the engagement, and it's like a line that's going straight down. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very, very bad. Because what's going to happen to this company essentially is their trajectory is going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the saddest companies because clearly if a founder was able to pull off a trajectory like this, there's something to the founder. But either because he's received bad advice or he hasn't seeked out the right advice. Mm -hmm. um, he's made a different set of choices, which is going to make it very, very difficult for him over the next six to 12 months. Uh, and so those things are you really, really need to watch out for. And then the, the last thing that is a complete non-signal and is, is borderline <laughs> sort of uh, uh, hilarious is a five-year forecast for a seed stage channel. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want, I, do you still get pitch decks with five-year forecast? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd say half the half to seventy percent of the pitch decks I've I've seen have one of those in them somewhere. Um, and look, it's not that your plans for the next year don't matter. What matters is your milestones for the next round, right? Mm -hmm. What I what do you need to hit for the next raise? to basically de-risk yourself for the next raise, that's what matters. And, and of course, your assumptions, how you're thinking about growing, you know, what growth channels are you going to use? What sort of CAC are you going to have? All of that stuff is, is important. A five-year forecast is not important. Mm -hmm. And sort of th those, those milestones aren't necessarily revenue milestones, right? For a social, uh, social media company, it could be uh, a user growth milestone. It could be a milestone of number of transactions. If, you're not, if you haven't quite figured out what the take rate of monetization model is for, is for the marketplace. These are fairly normal issues for... Uh, 
uh, early stage uh, network effect companies. Uh, sometimes in the European ecosystem, we're a bit conservative. And so we tend to discount companies that uh, that aren't monetizing at sort of pre-seed or seed or don't have clear line of sight to monetization. But I mean, think about it. If you followed that approach, Facebook wouldn't have gotten funded. Mm-hmm. Uh, so oh, yeah. there is, like for 10 there years, is, they did not have any profits. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, you need to... There are companies, especially those with network within those with network, with network effects, that are going to follow that model and it's going to be successful. So you know, if European investors don't fund it, the US ones will. Uh, I, I think we're seeing some some progress on European VC. I think it's getting a bit more sophisticated, but I think there needs to be more movement there. Got it. You, so so according to you, uh, is, is retention one of the most important metric to to look at? Yes, retention and and, and engagement, and I, I'll say. Sort of both because you can have situations where retention initially is low when you have sort of a user base of 100 million. Uh, but let's say you know you've defined what the core action is. You know, a user has to create a post. That's generally what what happens, and other people react with it. And you see that the number of posts per user are going up as you've gone from you know 100 users to 500 users or whatever. And the retention at that point is is not exceptionally high. But that tells you that directionally uh, your retention is going to go up. Because cohort on a cohort level, your future either your your future users are more engaged than your previous ones, or your users are getting more engaged over time, or both. And both of those will have some sort of an impact on retention. So that can be a leading indicator for retention. I will look at retention because if the retention is high, I mean it's that's an easy easy yes, right? But uh, even in cases where retention is not high yet, if you're seeing that sort of pattern in engagement, uh, that's a very very good signal. Got it. You so are you only sticking to uh, companies for, for with network effects or or you or do you also do some investments on non network effects startups? No, exclusively network effects. I mean, I, I can do five, look. I have the capacity of five to six investments a year. If I go invest in a I don't know a deep tech health tech startup, I have absolutely no idea how to help them and it's taken up capital that I could have allocated to a startup I actually could have added, added value to, right? So it's it's that's a, a deliberate choice. It's partly interest, partly uh, uh, thesis in terms of where I think uh, uh, you have companies that are highly scalable and defensible, and also partly just realism of how much capital I have. Got it. Uh, you, you, you mentioned reasons for high conviction. You did, you did not mention about team, the, the founding team. Uh, would, would that would that be a qualifier for you as well? I mean, that's where the relationship to the problem comes. I wouldn't. I will never say that a founder needs to have X background for me to back them. In fact, usually, especially if you're creating, there, there's a there's a elegant chart that NFX has the the VC from Silicon Valley. They've gone that the ideal experience for a B two C founder is zero to five years, because at that point you're naive enough. Uh, to think up sol- certain solutions that someone more experienced just would not think. Of. Mm. If you're a B2B founder, you probably need, need a bit more domain expertise. So at that point, I'm kind of thinking, you know, what sort of background you've got in the space. But even there, I'm not sort of, I'm not heavily uh, background dependent. Look, I'm not investing in deep tech AI stuff, right? So I don't care yeah. if you have a PhD. The course of or... knowledge, isn't it? The, co- the course of knowledge. Yeah. So I'm not, I, I don't care if you've got a PhD. I don't care if you've worked in, I don't know, Ericsson or Siemens in in R and D or whatever. Uh, that that would, those would be relevant if someone's investing in deep tech. Well, I don't do that. Since I'm investing in network effects, the the quote unquote background of the founder doesn't really matter. Um, I've invested in folks a couple of years out of college. I've invested in folks that have. A track record of doing you know, crazy viral projects. Uh, I have also invested in folks that have had a reasonable amount of experience. Uh, and at least so far, like NFX, I would say that I haven't really seen too many patterns there, except that if you're doing something B2C, younger is better. Got it. Um, so I'm sure you have had bad decisions as well. Maybe you, you passed upon opportunities that you thought would fail, but they eventually succeeded. Could you could you give some learning lessons from your from your uh, past experiences? Now, part of the trouble with that is that I've only started angel investing in earnest early 2021, so mm-hmm. I'm I'm not sure I have enough data. But there is I give you the example of one company that where I was sort of trying to get in, uh, I lost the deal, but I was sort of not. Uh, I was a little bummed that I lost it, but I didn't think it'd be a child. It was like an earth shattering loss. Uh, and this is a company called No Unity. Uh, based out of Germany, which was building a social network for sharing notes uh, for high school students. Mm-hmm. And 
uh, they just raised like a 12 million series a their number the number one education app in like five different countries and i'm definitely uh, not happy to to not be in that uh, in that round uh, i i wish i wish i was uh, i was i was you, just trying you passed, up, you passed up that opportunity no i didn't pass it up i, I was trying to to get in but i lost that deal uh for sort of a combination of uh, combination of reasons but it also was not something when i when i lost it that that i was sort of very very down on myself for losing it ah, I, I, should have been, i should have been more down well again this is i've still i've only got so many data points so far i'll probably have a lot more in the next two years to share where i've sort of passed on deals and that company is turned into the next unicorn uh, so i'll put a pin in that one got it so so in in programs like atomico uh, does it does it is it important to maintain your reputation like say for example they they took a bet on you they gave you 100k usd to spend uh is it important for you to succeed to 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 be able to get get more in terms of as you said um... i think atomico is pretty uh, open that way in the sense of they they're cognizant of the fact that over one year you only have so much of a track record you can build up there are cases where you know you've got a very strong track record in a year uh, right. there are cases where you don't necessarily have a strong track record in a year but you still uh, they still give people uh, people money in those uh, situations as well i think what they're looking for is someone who is very engaged in actually deploying the capital and so if you can do that then you will get access to more capital because from the perspective of atomic what they they're trying to do is um democratize access to funding and access to angel investing and also increase their pipeline of opportunities right so if anyone who's going out actively investing and sourcing deals that fits the program got it got it um excellent do you have a preference between b2c and b2b startups not specifically uh anecdotally i've noticed that b2c founders tend to be more aware of network effects and b2b founders on average are less aware uh and so my portfolio is heavily skewed towards b2c so I've, of the seven five are b2c and two are b2b but that's not a deliberate choice it's just a function of kind of what i've seen and what um uh what i found i found interesting my most recent deal was was a b2b deal fundamentally i don't think the way you evaluate the network effect doesn't actually change at the end of the day you're looking for what the interaction is how well that interaction is working and that's pretty much it and of course are evaluating at scale how scalable or defensible this is but whether the company is b2b or b2c doesn't affect any of those things uh, how you implement it and execute on it changes uh, but none of those fundamental factors change so the way i advise them also doesn't fundamentally change and the way i work with them doesn't fundamentally change whether it's a b2b or b2c company all right if all factors were to remain constant um would you would you rather invest in a b2b or a b2c like like both were network effects both were um, yeah so all the high conv- conviction check boxes are ticked which one would you go for like i i'm, I'm going to cop out and say both because <laughs> if 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 it checks off everything then i have no reason to pick one over the other Uh, yeah the reason the reason i ask is i was having uh, i was listening to this conversation with with peter cowley uh, this is again uh, uh, upscalers uh, podcast and peter mentioned that the reason he has massively skewed all his investments are b2b is because consumers do not understand value businesses understand the notion of value um so i mean I, i did not dig deep into into the the nuance of what he wanted to say there but d- did you understand what he wanted to say there i think what he's trying to say is economic value is more concrete for for businesses versus consumers where con- consumers it's more amorphous so you know, i can i can see that if you are essentially selling something to consumers versus selling something to businesses the flip side of that is that businesses tend to be a far far more margin conscious than uh, than consumers are and especially if you're sort of you, i mean i i thought it's the opposite no margin conscious when i, when I say margin with that word their I, margin specifically so I especially see. about their margin so, so for example if you're doing a b2b marketplace uh versus a b2c marketplace the take rate discussion is a whole lot easier in the consumer marketplace because it's okay. value being given for them whereas and a b2b marketplace the business is going to be cognizant of okay this is the take that i'm giving how, how is that affecting my margins right got it 
So that there's there's always that's always two sides of a coin. That's not, I don't think that's a clear cut uh, decision. And then again on the consumer side, there's lots of different ways of monetizing without charging the end consumer directly. And and so despite you know things like advertising getting a bad rap uh, of late, uh, uh, at the end of the day, it's a viable model because you're giving free services to consumers, and it, there's still a ton of potential there. Got it. Um... We we are ending uh, towards the the end of this conversation. Um, what advice you have for new angel investors? So you are a full time investor. The new angel investors often have have a, have a, a day job and then they try to invest on the side. But yeah. there are many passionate angel investors who would eventually want to make it uh, make it as a full time investor. Yeah. How do you? What would be your advice to to learn, grow, and make this transition? The first and most important one is find a niche and a distinct brand. Um, there's even, even today, even with the market the way it is, there's still an awful lot of angel investors out there. So essentially for deals to find you and for founders to choose you, that part becomes really important. Ideally, find something that you are passionate about. It's very, very hard to build a niche uh, uh, sort of build a specific brand when you're when it's about something you don't really care about. So it's sort of very similar to the missionaries, not mercenaries discussion with, that we had about founders. So find something you care about that you can also add value with, um, and that can differentiate you as an investor and give you a unique brand. If you do those things, I think everything else will take care of itself. After that, all you need is persistence and you know, being competitive and sort of having a chip on your shoulder. Those things I think are if you have those personality traits already. Those things are easier to manage. the The brand bit is something you might need to do a bit more conscientiously. Okay, just just those two. I mean, to start with. <laughs> and second is obviously find find a way uh, to evaluate companies. Everybody's got a different way. Depending on kind of the niche you have, you're going to have different bets. So, like the way Dipali, uh, who focuses on female founders, evaluates a company, is going to be very very different from the way I evaluate a company. We will talk to each other because I, I I take note notes from her because I'm learning something that uh, that I didn't know she's going to take notes from me because she's going to learn something from from my approach. But sort of you have your core approach, uh, and and some of that you'll basically have to test because if you're doing this for the first time, these are essentially rules or sort of frameworks you're creating for yourself. You can borrow ones that are out there, but you basically need to make them your own and see the be. Be conscious about what works and what doesn't. Uh, the good, good thing about angel investing is, is, is that you have really highs and you have really high highs and really low lows. And so learn from uh, learn from the lows and sort of don't get too high with the highs. And uh, yeah, and then I guess the rest is just persistence. Uh, continuing to do it over long is very very hard to do this over six months or a year. It's a multi year uh, uh, process. Right. And what what should be the rationale for becoming an angel investor? Is 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 making money uh, okay uh, to be to be the the, the grounding uh, foundation? There's probably a very bad reason to become an angel investor <laughs> because uh, there's, there's a saying that angel investing is a very very expensive hobby, and for the for the vast because again because of the power law, for the vast majority of people and for the vast majority of startups you're dealing with, it is going to be a very very expensive hobby. So if you're doing this only for the money, there's probably better ways to make money. And there's probably better ways to make money sooner because you will not see your money for seven or 10 years in the best case scenario. If you're seeing money in one or two years and the startup probably didn't do too well anyway. Um, and so that um, you need to have an uh, innate sense of motivation that is beyond money about some sense of mission that leads you to do this. Uh, that leads you to persist, even though there are you do, there are no exits on the horizon for seven years, ten years. Even if you do see your company is doing very very well, uh, you do know that I mean, over a seven to ten year period, anything can happen. And so yes, it would be great uh, at that point if the return, the returns actually do come in, and then you can establish yourself not just as an angel investor, but as a uh, as an investor who's driving returns, raise a fund, stuff like that. And maybe that doesn't take seven years. Maybe that just takes three to five years. But it's still fairly uh, long term. When you're starting in, you need to have some sort of mission. And the, right. the, I think the stronger that mission is, the easier it becomes. The easier it makes everything else. 
so there are there are again two options right so if you are really mission oriented uh, you would rather want to build something of your own okay build your own startup than be an investor in in, in startups how do you make make that choice i mean it depends on what the mission is right so if the mission is to solve a very specific problem yeah uh, in some cases yeah you would be much better off starting a company but uh, take dipali's mission of uh uh making sure that female founders get get more investment i mean that's not really something you can solve with the, with the comp- with the company you could solve that with the fund potentially uh and maybe angel investing is a, is a path to that or or now she's a partner at speed invest so that problem sort of takes care of itself so she's now able to direct more and more funding towards female founders so it's the angel to to vc path that she's done that's helped her with that mission in my case my mission is essentially to preach the gospel of network effect if i had to, if i had to put it uh uh in in sort of a, a pity uh, comment and it's very very hard for me to do that from within a company I, if for me to found a company i would need to not just believe in network effects i would need to believe in a very specific problem that is solved by network effects enough that i am willing to give up looking at other sorts of companies and looking at where else network effects could apply and so so far i've never come across that so i basically carved this path out for myself because that's what feels closest to uh, the mission that i've created for myself right so 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 i'll give give a rational that i i just had the uh, last few days i mean you let me know if there is a flaw in this rational so i'm 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 passionate and i feel that if i ever build my own startup i will give everything but then i also feel that if i am giving everything to that one startup and knowing that 90% of the startups fail i would rather diversify and invest in a portfolio of startups than build build my own startup because then i am only building my own startup and that that is heavily um that is heavily i mean it's it's not in all likelihood it would fail right um i i also i also understand that uh, founders do not start with this intent founders start with with hope and possibility uh, but is there is there a flaw in this rational that okay, one should be an investor because if you build your startup you're just building one startup and there's no guarantee that you'll succeed i mean i i'll give you sort of a generalized saying that the the live heard which i think applies in here and in that diversification is very very good for wealth preservation it's not very good for wealth creation whereas if you want to create wealth you need concentration mm. uh, uh and i think that applies to sort of uh, essentially the, uh, this time if you're a founder and you're sort of going into your idea sure i mean sure there's nothing stopping you from going and investing in other startups but if you see that as a way of diversifying your risk of uh of doing your startup i i think there's uh, I, i think being a founder isn't necessarily the right role for that for that person uh you essentially need to be all in mission oriented like this is it this is the problem and essentially eliminate all other options uh to the point where this becomes your core reason for being and uh and i think that is a i mean of, of course that's not the only thing you need you need lots lots of other things to go right before you can you can build with right do think you need that kind of a mindset got it excellent um last last question here uh, we 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 all here hearing about the impending recession stagflation they say as well uh, what what do you make of of uh, this 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 coming coming phase I mean, I'll give you sort of two on. I'll, I'll caveat my answer. Right? My, my, the caveat is that I'm not uh, a macroeconomic specialist, so I try to spend less attention on that because whatever predictions I make, they're probably going to be wrong. Uh, I, I've learned I've learned to essentially stay within my uh, my lane. So I'll, I'll be curious about other things. I'll read about things, but I'm not necessarily going to make long term decisions based on those things. That said. <laughs> uh, I don't necessarily see a dot dot com style collapse happening uh, within tech because right now you've got companies that have real customers that have real businesses and yes the valuations of them were inflated over the past year but they still have real customers and real businesses those those aren't going away there are of course some companies you know like the WeWorks of the world and the 10 minute grocery delivery companies that are that probably did not really fit that a uh, bill of having sustainable business models and so some of those companies are going to uh, go out thankfully but um the vast majority of 
tech companies at scale, I think are it'll be a bump in the road, and then it'll uh, it'll essentially normalize. Is is what uh, is what I think. I mean that's. But then again, you also have the crypto world, right? Where I think the the dot com uh, comparison applies more a, a, a bit more in the sense that utility is still questionable. There's an awful lot of uh, a lot of it is built on speculation, and this tends to happen in sort of the early cycles of any new tech era. So I think if there is potential fallout, it's probably likely to be a bit more severe there. So the crypto tends to have these sort of boom cycles and then what they call crypto winters. And so the likelihood of, I think, a crypto winter is exceptionally high. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot more pain over there. But I think that pain is healthy because it drives out an awful lot of speculators and evangelists and folks who are talking about you know, uh, very broad ideas without actually being specific about what it solves. And it leaves folks who are serious about building a real meaningful product for real people. Um, and I think that's good for the ecosystem. Right. And uh, what what would you suggest angels to keep keep investing? Um... I mean, look, uh, downturns are the best time to invest because there's not massive wars over deals. Valuations aren't getting inflated. Uh, again, building a startup is a seven to 10 year cycle. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you invested in year two of a startup in a 10 year journey and that year two happens to be a recession, does it matter? Uh, not really. I mean, part of the problem, though, of course, is that if you're an angel that's investing personal capital uh, and a lot of your personal capital is in public markets that have collapsed, uh, you have less capital to invest. Uh, so that is unfortunately a very real situation that happens with LPs for, for funds as well. Um, so I mean, in that case, it can be tighter. But I mean, if you have access to the capital, I, I there is no reason to slow down just because, quote unquote, the market has uh, slowed down or, or there is a recession out there. Companies are being built every day. If you see a compelling company, if you have conviction in the company, there's no reason why you shouldn't invest because of timing. Would you give the same suggestion to founders that, uh, because I heard that founders will, will slow down, they will they will go back to their safe jobs and come back when the when the environment is better? I mean, the I, the uh, the thing I told you about crypto evangelists, I think, applies here as well. In the sense that if you were a tourist founder who was building a company because it's easy to get funding, uh, <laughs> those aren't really the right founders to invest in anyway. The right founders to invest in are, who are, are doing who are doing this because they deeply believe about, believe in something, and so they will build whether the market is bad or the market is good. Those are the kind of founders I'm looking I'm looking for. So in general, the signal to noise ratio on the founder end also improves dramatically in situations like this, which is even better for angels. Is there a term tourist founder or is this your making? It is mine. <laughs> <laughs> tourist founder, good one. So so in the last few years, uh, where, where the valuations were were uh, touching uh, touching the sky, there were a lot of tourist founders because because they're just joining the bandwagon, right? I guess yeah, because it's. Uh, you know, if you're an MBA, you're working in a consulting job, you're an investment banker, you see all of these founders raising large amounts, feels like, yeah, I want to do that. Uh, and so you, I think the, the more accurate term, I guess, would be a lifestyle founder. Uh, th that, that's a term that's, that's actually used. Um, and so you have more and more lifestyle founders in, in sort of market environments that way. And they tend to drain out when uh, when market environments get, get tougher, investing, uh, finding, getting access to investors gets harder. And so what's left are the real builders, uh, or at least on, on average. I'm not going to say that that's the case throughout and that every single founder is sort of an exceptionally high quality founder. There is the power law at play again. Um, but in general, in terms of the signal, signal to noise, noise ratio, it tends to vastly improve during down markets. Excellent. Well, this brings us to the end of a fascinating conversation with, with Samir. Samir, this was like lots of aha moments, very intellectually stimulating. Especially, I, I get a high whenever I'm learning something massively. And this conversation was was, was a journey of learning for me. Thanks. Thanks a ton. Uh, on a weekday, after after a day-long work, uh, you you gave, gave me this time. Uh, cannot thank you enough for this. Thank you for having me on, Ravi. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, intellectual conversations are always fun. Uh, and so ending the day with one of these just sort of uh, helps me relax. Excellent. And if people were to find you, uh, how could they reach out to you? 
Uh, depending on kind of how they uh, want to work. If you're trying to pitch a startup to me, just email me at samir at breadcrumb.vc. You don't need a warm intro. I'm completely okay with cold inbounds. Half my portfolio is cold in inbounds. Uh, if you want to take my course, just Google for applied network effects. The landing page has the application form and all the info you need. Uh, and for anything else, just sort of follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Excellent. Thanks again, Samir. Sorry, yeah, because even in this market, you do see oversubscribed deals. And when that happens, it's uh, it's not the investors with the clearest value add are tend to be the most secure on the cap table. Ah, uh, nice, excellent. This is this is uh, aha moment for me.